Ready. Well, good morning, everyone. I would assume everyone's got a Bible. And, well, and you didn't, but you know where to get them, so that's good. From a hotel. Okay, this, this hotel Bible is good. It all works. So if you have a cell phone, then please silence it. Put it on vibrate, stun, kill, whatever you, whatever you do with it. Um, when I was uh, planning this teaching, it was not going to be this teaching. Because um, as I was studying it, it was really pretty large. My original, I was going to talk about God's power, but... How can, how can you talk about God's power in, you know, five hours, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, where does it begin? Where does it end? In Genesis, in Revelation, well before Genesis and well after Revelation. So God's power is ever existent. So it was impossible to teach something I couldn't even get my arms around and it was really bothering me so I just asked the Holy Spirit what what do you want me to teach because I'm obviously of my own uh, thoughts I'm oblivious to uh, to what I what I need to be teaching then my son texts me hey dad want to see a movie of course I like to spend time with our son and uh, he says, well, get four tickets to the Avengers. Well, I've never, I don't remember seeing an Avenger movie. Uh, my son tells me about an Avenger movies, but I consider them pretty ungodly and superheroes and all that stuff. But in any case, um, I said, sure. You know, I'll use my little AMC thing app on my phone and I'll, I'll uh, buy us some tickets. He wanted to go opening day, but we ended up the next day. And in, in this movie, and I'm not recommending anyone see it, but I'll tell you the important parts. Anyways, um, Chris Pratt, uh, you, the, the movie opens up and there's fighting and, you know, people being slugged and all this, all this stuff. It's all going on. And there's, there's a villain, of course, um, named Thanos. And uh, he's mad, he's trying to kill everybody. Chris Pratt, known as Star-Lord, that should give you an idea of why we don't see these movies, uh, was asked by the villain, who is your master? Who is your master? And then Chris Pratt's thinking as he's, you know, fighting somebody, he goes, is this the part I'm supposed to say Jesus? Well, Jesus just got top, top, you know, a pretty good billing in, a, in a, a movie people have been waiting for years to see. And I hear chuckles in the audience, but my wife and I were sitting in our reclining chairs, because this theater is pretty nice. We're sitting, reclining, and we're like, yes, this is where. I don't know why I just didn't stand up and start shouting it. Yes, this is where you say your master is Jesus, because Chris Pratt is supposedly a Christian, um, and that's between him and God. But... Um, Anyway, so that just, that just stuck out at me, and it didn't it immediately hit me, but then I started thinking about it more and more <clears throat> about how this movie is like the world, and um, that these superheroes really aren't super, and they're, they're missing a major element, which is uh, eternal life. They can't offer any. They can just save our flesh. The, the, the antagonist of the movie, Thanos, is uh, called Lord Thanos. I like how everyone's got a name Lord, you know? So Star-Lord, Lord Thanos, which stands for God of Death. Wow, sounds really like a neat adversary name. In interesting what antagonist means. It means your adversary, hostile to someone, which I believe this movie is hostile against God. So, which is most. All, all of these antagonists, all of these adversaries, and you notice who is our adversary? It's the devil, the devil that seeks to kill and destroy. So all of these, all of these lords over us, except for the Lord, 
all seek power to control the world and the universe, just like Satan. All of them want to be God. In this movie, the guy needed to get a, 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 a he needed to get gems on his hand. Each gem was for something, and one of them was for a soul, and he had to go find the soul uh, gem. And he went to find the soul gem, and the guy says, well, everyone's died that's tried this so far, but, the, but they missed, he says, well, what's missing, or else I'll kill you if you don't tell me, uh, what is it that you're missing that has, what, what do I have to do to get this soul uh, gem? And the, the character says, there has to be a sacrifice. Really, there has to be a sacrifice. So here we go, we've got this Lord guy, this adversary, and there has to be a sacrifice for him to get control of everybody's soul in the universe. Because really, these guys act in the universe, not just the world. Matter of fact, when Chris Pratt was asked, who is your master? And he said, is this the part I'm supposed to say, Jesus? Then the bad guy says, are you, are you from Earth? Interesting about that, how our answers tell who we're from where we're from, who is, who is our master. Many times our answers will tell who we are. In this case, he was from earth, but um, it's just interesting to note that our answers, people can denote from our answers where we are and who we serve. So um, the sacrifice, however, was not his own sacrifice. He did not have to kill himself on a cross. Okay, he did not have to shed his blood. But he did have a loved one, and he had to sacrifice her. Okay? So he had to sacrifice her. This is not at all a Christophany. <laughs> this is not at all a Christophany, folks. Because he is not sacrificing himself, you know, in the Trinity, and he, which they're making it appear like that, and some maybe uh, Christology people, uh, the theologians might, might think, oh yeah, look at that, it's just like Jesus. No, it's not. You know, this, this daughter did not want to die. She was not willing to die, but he killed her and threw her to her death anyways. This is not at all like God. But... It's interesting how they, 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 they move this stuff around and they, they tort everything that's in the Bible and they, and they have these, these, these parallels, you know what I mean? That are kind of parallel but really screwed up. But, you know, when I went to that movie, and that, this is not going to get frisky or anything here, so, you know, but I wore a t-shirt so that way, people would know who my master was. And, it, and it's the superheroes. Yeah, with Jesus in the middle. Let me tell you how I saved the world, okay? My son saw this because he told me everyone's getting dressed up. Everyone's going to be dressed up, Dad. So, you know, he wasn't dressed up, of course. But everyone's dressed up as Superman and, and Supergirl and all this stuff. But I'm wearing this, and my son looks at the shirt, and I'm expecting it. My son's not a believer yet, but I know God will uh, have his way with him. But um, he says, Dad, that's a very appropriate shirt. And then he calls over Megan. He says, Megan, look at my dad's shirt. Now, I'd expect him to be a little bit offended being a non-believer, but he wasn't offended at all. He's like, look at it. He's got a, an appropriate shirt. Now, he doesn't mention the name of Jesus, but you know, the Lord's working on him. I see him softening up my son. But you see, the only hero worth the price of admission is Jesus Christ. Because he paid it all. He paid it all. And he did it willingly. He didn't drag his feet down the road. He didn't have, he didn't have to be grabbed by the hair and thrown off a cliff. He didn't have any of that stuff. He walked carrying his cross. He, he wasn't dragged carrying his cross. He did it because he loves us. He did it to show us how we are to love others and what we're supposed to do in our lives. That's what, he's, that's what he was doing. He wasn't dragged like in the superhero movies. Kids dream 
and pretend they're superheroes. Halloween time comes. They got all these costumes out. We really need to tell our kids, these are not superheroes. This is your superhero, not me, not dad, not Joe, okay? Superhero, Jesus, right here in the middle. And he should be here in the middle, right? In the middle of our hearts. Hopefully my heart's in the middle, maybe it's over here, but I don't know, but you get it. So, but we have all these things, and our kids are learning all these false things, and they're all in the Avengers movies, and you know what? Um, I was talking to a friend of mine in California about this movie, and he said, you know, in the theater, people were crying out as the superheroes were, were disintegrating. No, not him. The people they worshipped were like being disappearing. Why'd you do that? And then, the, then Chris Pratt had on his tweets and his Facebook all these hate talk. Why'd you do that? Why, he almost had the glove off of him. Why did you try to save this person? Why did, and they were all blaming Chris Pratt for, the, for, for what happened at the end of the movie. It was amazing. They don't even realize it's a movie, I think. They really live, they, they live these things. The deadly flaw of all the superheroes, besides all being alive from hell, is they have souls that need to be saved. And they can't save souls. They can only save dying flesh, and only until it dies permanently from age or disease or whatever, whatever the things are of the world. Bad guys never offer eternal life. Good guys never offer eternal lives. They only demand that you follow them. The superheroes demand that you call upon them. Uh, and the devil gave us all these superheroes. An endless supply, just like this endless supply of the 600 plus Hindu gods that all want us to call on them. What isn't it? The Hindus, I think, that have like, just like in the Bible, there was like the, um, the unknown God. You always got to have the one unknown God. How can you worship like 600 gods and then have one with no name just in case you missed one? How is that, how is that even close to faith in anything tangible that's, that's worth anything? The devil gives us all these bad guys and all these evil, so we focus on, on Freddy, we focus on the Joker, because he doesn't want us to focus on him, the real adversary. He wants us to focus on the other adversaries, our fears, all those things. Freddy even gets you in your dreams. I don't know how many times I get a caller. I had one this morning text me. Luckily, I was up already. But he texts me and goes, I had a dream. I had a dream, and everyone was coming after me. I'm like, Listen, here's three scriptures. Go read them now, okay? Because this is not of God. People, they, Freddy gets in our dreams. The devil gets in our dreams, just like the devil. And so all of these people, it's all an attack from different angles using our sin nature to fear them so we can stay in bondage with them. So we need fake superheroes to save us from the fake villains. In the movies, that's the way it always is. We always got to have the, we always got to have Superman to save us from uh, whoever he saves us from, and we got to have Batman to save us from the Joker and Scarface or whatever his name is. Been a long time since I've seen those things. But what they never give us in the movies is a true savior, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Maker of heaven and the earth, and that have from the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. They never give us that guy probably come up with Alpha and Omega Man pretty soon. So uh, right now, we can turn to our Bibles to Matthew 6, 19, which will be our scripture for our main scripture that we're going to be going to this day. Matthew 6, 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where a moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where neither thieves do not break in or do not steal. For where is your treasure? Where? Sorry. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. The eye of the lamp, the eye is the lamp of the body, so that if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, 
your whole body will be full of dark. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Well, God tells us, he, he doesn't say you maybe can't, he says you cannot serve both God and mammon. So if we, if we look at, oh, I made a note, I put lots of stars, pray, you gotta pray. All right, Lord, we just thank you for your word, we thank you for Matthew that, to, to actually pen these things for us that are important scriptures for us to know. Uh, we pray that you would uh, bring us to the saving truth and knowledge of the saving grace of your son, Jesus Christ, that made us, uh, as we follow him, that our sin nature does not have dominion over our lives, Lord. We just thank you for this time. We pray our ears would hear and our eyes would see the light, that our eyes would be open to the light and not closed to dark, closed and locked away in darkness, Lord. We thank you and praise you. All right, and that's why I put those stars there. Okay, so the word masters, so if we break down the scripture, so we got a mas we got masters in it. So what, what is mass? Uh, the Bible says uh, in, in, in Luke 16, it reaffirms Matthew. It says, no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one or love the other. Same thing, you cannot serve God and mammon. Uh, Elijah Came, came to the people and said, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Wow. They're just dead ears. Dead eyes. Dark. But it, it, it's true. If the Lord is God... Follow him. You got to choose a master. Follow him. You can't stay in the middle of the road. It, a choice to decide tomorrow, a choice to decide in an hour, a choice to decide next year is not a choice of choosing God. It's a, it's a, it is a choice, but it's a choice not to choose. And it's a choice that you chose not God because you'll either follow him or you'll follow the devil. So you have to choose. In Galatians, if I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. That's just an excerpt from that scripture, not the whole thing. So if I'm trying to be a servant of men, I'm not a servant of Christ, because men are filled with earthly demonic wisdom. We need to, unless they're godly men, and then you still have to subject them to the word of God to make sure that what they're telling you is correct. In James 4.4, 4, Whomsoever chooses to be a friend of the world renders himself an enemy of God. An enemy of God. How many of us are friends of the world? Making ourselves enemies of God. Every day we have to struggle this. You may think that you've already chosen your, your decision, but every day the devil's trying to derail us. Who, who, who is he talking to? Who, who, who is this Matthew verse talking to? The believer, which I call the flesher. So we've got the believer fleshers. We always think he's talking to some unbeliever or the other guy, but he's really talking to us. As we read the word of God, he's actually talking to me as I'm reading it. As he's talking, as you're reading the Bible, he's talking to you. He's not talking about your wife or your husband or your, your friends. He's talking to you. That's what he's talking to. Because he's trying to have a relationship with you. He wants to have a fellowship with you. He wants to be your master. And if you have a master, you listen to your master. If you're an ambassador, like if Trump has an ambassador, the ambassador speaks of the things that Trump wants him to say. He doesn't say, I hate America. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, so he doesn't say things contrary to what his boss says to do. An ambassador speaks what his boss says. So what? So what else can be our what else can be our master? Uh, more than just uh, a job or money, because a lot of people just think a mammon is job and money. 
So how about hate? How about resentment? How about fear? We see fear all the time. We have fear. When we have a bad dream, we have fear. When something goes wrong, we have fear. But you know, I got news for you. It doesn't matter what you fear. Do you know who's on the throne? Who? Christ is on the throne. And he's always going to be on the throne. And you can't knock him off his throne. If you don't believe in him, he's still on the throne. If you swear at him, he's still on the throne. If you turn your back on him, he's still on the throne. You can't put him off the throne. Thor can't put him off the throne. Lord, whatever, can't put him off the throne. Nobody can knock him off the throne because he's there to stay. He's there to stay. What about unforgiveness? We all have to struggle with unforgiveness. Like, you know, we got to forgive. Oh, should I forgive? They didn't ask me for forgiveness. God didn't put forgive seven times 70 if they ask you to forgive them. He doesn't say that. Hard-heartedness. How many hard hearts are in heaven? Yeah. You don't even need the calculator for that. Because the calculator, you just turn it on and it says the right number. Zero. Zero hard hearts. Can you imagine being in heaven, there's hard hearts? You know, Jesus, you know, my mother-in-law, she's just really horrible. And, you know, my brother and my sister, they're just really bad people. And, you know, so-and-so said something about my new angel gown or something and it didn't like what I was dressed in up here in heaven. Yeah, really, do we want to hear it? Does Jesus want to hear it? No, he already had to hear it. He has to hear it all the time. That's why he probably goes, no, 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 no. doesn't want to hear us. How about selfishness? Selfishness. Anyone ever selfish? Probably. I'm probably selfish. Pride. Pride's, pride's a killer. Pride's a big deal. Pride is, I think the pride is probably the number one thing the devil uses to kill us. To drive us. What kills us? A separation from the Father kills us. All right? It's not, maybe not immediate, but it's a gradual. We start to be separated. We start to maybe say bad things, our foul language starts coming back, our thoughts start coming back. The farther we get from the Savior, the worse it starts to get for us. And, and then, he, then he says, oh, how about the pride? Did you hear what she just said? Did you hear just what he said? I need to tell him he's wrong. I need to tell her she's wrong. I just can't believe this. I just do so much. I work so hard, and I just get no appreciation. I deserve a raise. Pride, covetousness, looking at what other people have. Man, he's got a nice new mower. About that guitar, you know? That guitar, if I had a guitar like that, I could probably sing like an angel. Probably not, but maybe I could play like an angel. Covetousness. Whatever you think, whatever you think you possess that stands in, in between you and God, you need to really think about eliminating it. And I think about that a lot because, you know, as, as every day passes, you know, you just wonder, uh, what am I doing this for? Other than the godly things. What am I doing? What am I, what am I working for? What am I doing this thing for? Why, why, am, I, why am I wanting to go out, out and do this? What is, what is this for? What is, unless it can be for God, it's really going to burn up. So it really doesn't have much value to me. And so I'm always thinking about, wow, is this real? Is this something that I'm like now? This is taking God's time that I should be spending on doing godly things that he, that I can't even hear him because I'm so busy doing stuff. I mean, for me, I work, I, I work pretty long hours and I'm always talking to people on the phone. I'm always working on people's credit and stuff like that, trying to get them back in shape. It takes a lot of time and I'm thinking about, wow, this really possesses a lot of my time. But I try, you know, and sometimes it overlaps. It overlaps my Bible reading time. I mean, if I start out the day and I and and I don't do the Bible reading, and if, and if I don't post if I don't post on the marriage hotline and on Harvest the daily Bible readings right in the morning, if I do one thing before I do that, I I I miss it. It's like I'm completely out of order. My wife always goes, "Hey, hey, don't forget." I know I just gave you 20 things to do when you just opened your eyes this morning, but you got to go uh, do, do what you usually do. Okay, so I've got 20 things on my list now, and, and now I'm going to do this. But i got to be reminded to do, to do the things I'm supposed to be. Why, do we, why do, do we need a master? Why can't we be our own master? 
I can be a good master. I'll treat myself good. I'll buy myself nice clothes, you know, give myself a steak every day, you know, yummy. So that's what I, that's what I do for myself here. I'm just going to pamper myself. Why do we need a master? Because I'm a sinner. Because when I popped out of my mommy, I was certified and tagged, toe tagged, just like in the, in the morgue for hell. I should have worn a toe tag today. It said hell on it. Walk around barefooted. Everyone could see where I, was, where I was headed. Hell. And I don't really need a name in hell because no one gets a chance to talk to me because I'm busy gnashing my teeth. So why do we, we need a master? Because we're born slaves to sin. Because we have a sin nature. We're fleshers. Fleshers. We're going we're gonna to copyright that. Just like fake news. It's going to be copyrighted. Get my lawyers on the phone. We need to be. So he also talks about we cannot serve two masters. So what does serve mean? Well, the Bible says in Matthew, then Jesus said to him, get you, get you hence Satan, for it is written. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him sometimes. Every once in a while, every other day, just on Sunday. No, no. What do you say? Only, always. In Joshua, it says, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. He said today, didn't he? We need to examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith today and tomorrow when we leave this building. We have to decide whether what who we serve. However, in Joshua, in uh, I believe it's 20, he says, but as for me, how many people have this sign in your house? In my house, we will serve Darth Vader. No? The Lord. But for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. That's what he says. So at least Joshua had it right. Although Joshua, you know, he had his hard times. He had his hard times, you know. It wasn't until the end of Joshua where he didn't, he, he was doing really well. And then he just started to crack up at the end. I forget which chapter it was. Late 20s or something. But he, they'd gone into, they had gone into battle. They'd won, God had brought him lots of battle. I mean, he like threw snowballs from heaven and killed people. He like stopped the, he like had it be daylight for God knows how long. Okay, and he, he did all this for his people, and then they lost a battle. They lost a battle. They killed who knows how many tens of thousands of people. Well, they didn't do it. God did it. But, but then Joshua throws himself on the ground, and he says, Lord, why have you done this? Why did you take us out of Egypt if you were just going to have us lose these 30-something guys? Why did you, look at, did he really have to go back to Egypt? Did he really have to bring the Egypt thing up? Just, just crazy. So he brings him up, and he's, and he's complaining to God about losing these guys, and what does God say? And this is what God tells us. When we're having a pity party, when, when things are really, when the world is coming down on us, this is what he said. Get thee up. Get thee up. It's real simple. That's what we have to do. Get thee up. Stop your belly aching. Then God explains it to him. You weren't following me. You didn't consult me. I wasn't your master. You guys went off and decided to go take this land that I didn't tell you you could have on your own time and your own efforts, and you can see you can do nothing without me. And we can do nothing without God. In 1 Kings, if the Lord is God, follow him. Okay, we actually have that one. Great. I think that ball guy is probably some superhero in, in the next Avengers. Probably they'll be putting him in a bail. So um, in, in 2 Kings, they feared the Lord and that served their own gods after the manner. So they feared the Lord, but then they served their own gods anyways. And we fear, we fear of going to hell, maybe a little. Uh, we think we're going to heaven. But yet we serve other gods. We serve our small g gods. We have to examine ourselves. Are we serving God today? Ezekiel, go serve everyone his idols, but later you will surely listen to me. And my holy name 
you will profane no longer with your gifts and with your idols. God doesn't, it sounds like God really doesn't, he doesn't really have like a gray area here. In Romans, it says you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness. We all want the latter. We all want the righteousness. But are we all willing to be obedient? In 1 John, do not love the world nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the Father, the love of the Father is not in him. These, these, are, these are heavy words. This, you know, he really, they really lay it out here for us. If anyone loves the world, the Father, the love of the Father is not in him. The word mammon talks about mammon. Says, you know, well, one of them, and the NASB, it talks about wealth, but, but I prefer to, to look at the King James uh, to, to see mammon. So mammon is actually an Aramaic term for wealth, property, or anything of value. It also refers to any or all of which some people serve instead of God. So it's not just about wealth, so this NASB is a liar. Probably the other Bibles, many Bibles are liars, when it, concentrating us on wealth. wealth. Wealth ain't our only problem. We got all sorts of problems. We got the cults, okay? In Florida, they got the gators. So, and not the ones that are in the, in the, in the water, because you gotta watch out for those. So, so anything, anything that we serve other than God is the, is the mammon that we, they're talking about. The Bible says, put to death. Put to death. Not put to sleep. Put to death. Whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Well, earthly nature would be sin nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. That's Colossians 3, 5. God wants us to put this to death. Not just put it in a headlock and make it sleep for five years or a month or two years until we, until we pop out of it and we're, we're, our sin nature has dominion over us. Our sin nature doesn't have to have dominion over us if we understand the finished work of the cross that Christ died to cover up our sins. The final covering upon us should we fall, choose to follow him. God's word says we cannot serve two masters. So you can get out your calculators like Greg says. Count how many masters you can serve. Count them out. One. Okay, you can stop. Okay, so that was, that was an easy class for this. So I have to ask you, who is your master? I have to ask because God is asking, and, he asks, and he's asking me daily, who's your master? And I asked the Holy Spirit, which Jesus said would teach me everything, and you too. And he woke me up preaching the question to you, who's your master? And to me, of course, because I, I, I fall away. Do not let your flesh be master over you. Do not let your feelings be master over you. We will all die. Do not de let death be master over you. If any of these things have gotten the best of you lately, you might want to ask yourself, who is my master? You might want to ask yourself that every day. Who's my master today? Do we want, do we want the world? We say no. But do we, want, do we want to do more of the world than we want to do more God? Because doing God is, 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 is struggles against our flesh, because our flesh wants us to do its bidding. It wants, a, it has an itch, we go to scratch it. It's, oh, it's the flesh is always draped on us, always working on us, always trying to drag us, drag us down. The world wants to give us fears. What kind of fears? Anyone here at Global Warming? Everyone, anyone worried about getting old? You know, I got like some spots here and there, you know. Getting old, my son sees him and goes, man, you should do something about that, Dad. I said, I'm getting old, I'm gonna die. You understand, I'm going to die, and I want, and 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 I'm going to go to heaven because I follow Jesus. You want to go to heaven too? 
So we, we search anti-aging. I see billboards in Florida. 70 is the new 40. Really? 70 is the new 40? Wow, that's some really strange age math right there. But they're like, they're, they're like cling to everybody's insecurities. Oh, I, I want to be able to, you know, box like when I was young and play sports like when I was young. Not like you could do anything at 40 anyways. It should be the new 20 or something, right? If they really, if they really wanted to make us happy, I guess, you know, next year and five years, it'll be the 70, 80 will be the new 20. But right now, there's, I, I, know, I didn't call them to say, how can I be, I'm not 70 yet, but I will be, but how do I get to be the new 40? Do we uh, donate to find a cure for cancer? Donate for all these things. Donate, here, we've got to find cures for all these things. You know what? You're going to die. That's, that's actually the good news. You get to go to heaven. But for the people that, aren't, that don't know they're going to heaven or aren't sure they're going to heaven or, or aren't planning for heaven or don't even want to go to heaven, uh, they just want to be their own Lord, um, they have a lot of fear. So then they give us the fake answers. What you want... You want to overcome that fear? You need more money. You know, if your boss isn't nice to you, you need to like get a better job. He needs to pay you more money. How about if we're in school, we need better grades, a bigger house. We need to work out more, right? We need to eat right. My kids are always like, hey, dad, uh, you just like to eat gas station food. I said, yeah, well, you know, you know, they got me hooked on the gas station food. Want to have that stuff. But, um, I used to be really well into eating right and working out and stuff like that, but you know what? After I, after I got to know Jesus, it just didn't matter. I mean, you know, I don't like scarf with a, big, a bag of cookies. Well, yeah, I do, but anyway, I only, I'm only allowed one cookie, okay? And I did buy that, the, that container that they always have at the end of the aisle in the grocery stores of those orange things, you know, those orange slices? I always put it at the end of the aisle. And they always get stuck in your teeth. It's like, wow. And every time I'm in the grocery store with Kim, I walk by there, I go, mm, those are good. She goes, oh, you really like those. You should get them. I go, no, I'm not going to get them. And then she says, then every time we walk, it's like the 10th time we're at the grocery store. She goes, you should get them. I says, you really want those, don't you? Every, she says, yes, every time you walk by and say those things, I see those and I want them. But you can only have two a day. Like, what's the, what's the point of rationing some, of we're rationing my treat? You know, she's like taking the, the whole joy was stolen from me the minute she said, here, we can buy it. And then we get it home. She goes, here, here's your two. That's like a, that's what, that's like what you do with my vitamins. You just ration it. That's not what I wanted. I wanted the whole thing. There was not going to be anything for you. You should have bought your own. But that's me. I guess that's selfish. That's selfish, isn't it? So, so I digress. So I asked, the, I asked, I asked, and, 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 and God told me to tell you this stuff. So, more money, better grades, vitamins. How about, you know what? I'm depressed. They got something for that too. The world's got an answer for that. It ain't Jesus. Not by the world standards. Antidepressants, yes. Prozac, Abilify. We got schizophrenic, bipolar, split personalities, anxiety. We got everything under the sun, but no, but none of these doctors gave you. You know what? Do you read your Bible? Do you know Jesus? Do you know the Prince of Peace? Do you have a Savior? No, they don't ask you. That's not even one of their questions. How are you feeling? How's that drug doing for you? You know? I, you know, when um, years and years ago, my wife was diagnosed as bipolar, split personalities, depressed, wanted to kill herself every day, would say, oh, you know, honey, um, you know that knife? Every morning when I make your breakfast, I want to stab myself with it. I'm like, this is not, this is not logical. This is really not good. I just don't even know what to do, but hide the knives. I, don't, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know Jesus at the time. But you see, you know, it's amazing. They told her once they took on this, they took, gave her all these cocktails. Then the cocktails made things worse. It's these, these, the answers that I'm telling you this because the answers of the world are fake. Just like... These superheroes, they're fake, they're frauds, they're scams. They want you to be a slave to them. They said, you can never get off the Prozac. Never get off of it. Don't stop it. Don't ever stop. You're going to be honest the rest of your life. Wow, sounds really like a treat, doesn't it? 
but it didn't make things better. It made things worse because then there was no feelings anymore. God couldn't penetrate the Prozac because the choice was Prozac. The choice was the world. When we choose the world, God can't get through because we haven't chosen God. We chose the world answer. We chose the doctor, earthly, demonic, wisdom. That's what, that's what happened. And one day she goes, I'm not taking these stupid pills anymore. I'm going, and then I got fearful. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, what could happen? Because, you know, in the Avengers, there's such a thing called the Hulk, which is what we used to call Kimberly. So we would call her the Hulk, because if you made her mad, she would not turn green, but we felt like it, and we would run for our lives. So me and the kids. But anyways, once I found Jesus, and, and I was forced to because um, I found out I was not God, and I could not save myself or anyone else or my wife or my kids. I had needed Jesus. Once I realized I needed Jesus, I was able to speak things of God, wash my wife with words of the Lord, and, well, she wasn't bipolar anymore. She didn't want to die every day. She didn't want to run away. She didn't want to hide. She, she, wasn't, she, she wasn't scared all the time of all the demons that were harassing her anymore. But the answer is Jesus. Not these fake answers. The, the world wants to give us anything to make our flesh look better. Look at the commercials on TV. I mean, you don't see as many like cologne and perfume commercials as you used to, because I guess we're all just, we're all happy stinking. But there's plenty of other things. There's plenty of makeup commercials and things like that. And but there's, you know what, there's a predominance of uh, meds, for stop and smoking, which is which which is just it's just a vice that Jesus can cure, but you need chantix. The side effects are you may kill everyone in your house. To me, I would think that Jesus is a better choice because Jesus won't have me kill everyone in my house. They also have that they have that the the cartoon of the woman. You ever feel like this? Oh, oh, oh. My life is so hard. Try this, some sort of antidepressant. Look how happy she is now. Now she can go to work with three jobs, cook dinner, raise her family, take care of her husband. What a great woman she is. I mean, this is, the, this is all like program. This is all programming. We're looking at the world through the world's goggles. They put like these glasses on us that we only see the world uh, in, focusing on the things of the world. We see the billboards, we see the, the commercials, we see everything, all the signs. It's kind of like on the freeway work out there on the 65. There's all these detours and they got it here, lanes shifting, oh, lane uneven. And you're trying to follow those things. The world's always trying to follow those things, move us around the lanes. And to keep control of it, keep our focus. So we got to focus on it. And as long as we have our worldly goggles on, we can't see the God. We can't. We can't put our godly goggles on. We're locked. We're locked onto the world, changing lanes, shifting on us every single day, making us happy, making us sad, listening to music that makes us happy or sad, controlling us until it's too late to change a master because we run off the road and die. Some say you can't see the forest through the trees. It might be said that you can't see heaven through the world as long as you're wearing the world vision goggles. We need to take those world vision goggles off. The world should not be for a, a, a Christian believer's focus, but we should be focused on the things of heaven and bringing the lost to God to be saved through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which dwells among us, so that way we can minister to other people, ministering, Greg talks about that a lot, how we are to minister to people. We are reconcilers, as Christ has reconciled us with the Father, though we were sinners deserving of hell. So we have to, we have to be focused on things of God. How do, we, how do we focus on God? We read the Bible. We read the Bible every day. We go to Bible studies. We go to church like we do. We fellowship with other believers. We pray together. We the prayer meeting on Wednesdays. Bible studies on, on Fridays. These are, these are all important things in our walk. So we kind of talked a little bit about it earlier. So when we were in school, 
and we didn't follow the teacher's instructions uh, or, or the teachings. I did this a lot, especially through high school. I kind of lost interest. So didn't follow the instructions, and what, what did I get? I, I failed. I failed. And here we got the world gives us A, B, C, D, E, F. Not an E, but an F. As deceptions, making us think we've got some gray area. Our whole life is we, we believe that we have a gray area. <clears throat> that there's something that can we can be good enough to go to heaven. I think Israel suffers from that. The Jews suffer from that. They think they can follow all these rules, but they don't understand. They have a toe tag. Hell. That's where they're going without Jesus. There is no way through the Father except through the Son. The, the scriptures are really obviously. Nothing, nothing in this world is black and white. It's all relative. It's all feelings. It's all opinions. The world teaches us we can get a D and still graduate, a C and still graduate, a B and still graduate. Pass or fail, folks. That's what, that's what God says. Follow me. It's not, an, it's not an A or an F. It's a believer or a non-believer. A follower of a Christ or a non-follower of Christ. Jesus said, follow me. Do you think he just said it to a couple of people? A few people? He says it to us. He said it to you. He said it to me. That's why he accepted, him, accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior because he was calling to us. He said, follow me. We said, yeah. I think that'd be cool. I think I'll follow you. And then it gets rough. You know, we gotta, we got to stop doing things that we're not. Stop focusing on our world, God. Stop doing the things that we used to, used to think we'd enjoy, which, you know, it's amazing how little I miss of my old glamorous life, I guess I could call it. It was glamorous to me. But uh, how little I miss of that life when, I, when, when I'm with Christ, the, 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 the type of things that we focus on. So... We have, to, we have to be answering that all day long. Who do we listen to? Do we listen to, do we try, always try to seek God's wisdom, always try to, hey, is that something Jesus would do? So the, Satan said to Eve, surely you won't die. He said that. What a lie. Because surely she did die and she killed everybody else too <laughs> so but the devil is so wildly that he actually he actually can twist that he can say to her look at that you ate from that tree and look you're still alive you're still breathing you're still walking look at that god's god's a liar you're not dead look at you yeah go feed your husband yeah go hang out but but the devil twists that when we got the worldly goggles on we actually think we're still alive i thought i was alive before i knew christ but i was dead the devil told me i was alive before i knew christ but i was dead toe tag hell he didn't tell me that imagine that so even though you get away with something some sin some strongholds, some hard-heartedness, selfishness, pride, whatever sin it is, understand that sin always leads to death and God does not lie. And you need to clean your house. Clean your house of your sin. Ask forgiveness and accept it and change. Do the 180. Turn away from who you were serving that moment when you did that thing and turn and face Christ, who wants you to follow him. The devil hides our spiritual death from us until it's, until, until it's too late, until we're, until we're physically dead. So when we, when we go out of these doors after we had 20 minutes of praise, five hours of teaching, There will be our vehicles. And they're out there right now waiting for you. you. You know, when I sit here sometimes, I think, wow, I gotta, you know, wash that car. And, and, and but that's not an appropriate thought. So we'll, we're, we'll, be, we'll go walk out the door, we'll go, man, that's a dirty car. But it's gonna rain, God's gonna wash it, so I gave him the glory. And as we drive, there'll be cars coming this way and that way, and then we'll start focusing on that. The, the sermon's starting to get more distant. What was that sermon about anyways? 
something about service. I don't know. Anyway, so we start to forget, and then our stomachs will start growling and saying, feed me, feed me. Our houses will need cleaning. Our laundry will be cleaning. Our lawns will be needing to be mowed. But I did that yesterday, so I'm good today. So it didn't take long to get the worldly goggles back on our faces. Once we, once we walk out that door, I want you to be thinking, Joe said, where's my focus? Did I just strap on the world and I just go, oh, man, where'd God go? Oh, my God, I, I forgot. I have this fear. I got this problem. I got all this stuff. Oh, put Jesus is on the throne. What do you want for me to do today? So when we, let's say we go out the doors and we say, we start looking for souls. Because that's our job, so save the lost. Feed the hungry. But they're really hungry for the word. So be watching to how you can represent Christ so that way your answer is just like in the beginning of the sermon, people will know who your master is. So when you answer, you won't go, is this the time I'm supposed to be saying Jesus? Is this the time I'm supposed to be asking for forgiveness? Is this the time I'm not supposed to be smoking my cigarette? Is this the time I'm not supposed to be doing this or doing that? Looking at the pretty girls? I know none of us guys do that. Those are for the guys in Texas, right? That's what Craig always says. We're not that, we're not in Indiana. We're not those kind of guys. Thank God. I really do thank God. So, Bring me the poor, lost, and the hungry, and I will feed them, says the Lord. So that's what we're supposed to do, but he's not talking about their, their bellies. He's, he's talking about their souls. Feed them. Feed them the bread of life. But in order to feed them the bread of life, we, we, we have to actually have the bread of life in us. We have to be in our word, prayer, and fellowship. So no, we can't just hide in the building, and we're not supposed to be hiding in the building. Like some churches, you know, they, they, like I think in Kansas City, they got a 24-hour church. They just throw themselves on the ground for 24 hours. But they're young, so they can do it, you know, and they just act out all this weird stuff. Um, and uh, so they keep themselves inside the church. But that's, we're not supposed to be hiding in the church. So we're supposed to keep our heavenly goggles on. And here, this is how we keep our heavenly goggles on. Okay? We stay in the word. We take it to work. You must take it to work because you left it, your Bible in the car, right? So, okay, good. good job. Okay, so let him be an example. Anyone that wants to know how to take a Bible to work and get away with it, just, just see Mike afterwards. He'll, he'll counsel you as how to sneak a book into your work. Keep this book with us like we do our phones. We all carry our phones. We browse it. What we need to be just what we need to be doing is let's do everything to this Bible that we do to our phones. Browse it, search it, listen to it, talk to it, help me, Lord, be more like you. And worship this book like we do our phones. Because you know, when we forget our phones, we turn around and go get it. When we forget our Bibles, we don't turn around. When our phone calls us, we answer it. There I stand at the door and knock. Answer it. It's Christ. The one who answers will dine with him and, and him with you. We need to answer the call. And this is the living word. Stronger than a two-edged sword. Good for reproof, correction. Standing back up in imputed righteousness, as Greg likes to talk about. And never returns void. Never returns void is an interesting term. I used to think about never returns void to me. It never returns void to God. Never returns, because he sends it out. And, it all, and, the, and, the, and, and the people he's talking to, they return to him. It's like a, a boomerang. Is that how you throw a boomerang? No, that's a frisbee. I think you throw a boomerang. I don't know, how do you throw a boomerang like that? Some, and it comes off, it comes back to you, and that's God. He's throwing out the book. It comes, it never returns void. He sends it out, and, and, it, and it brings it back to him. That's, that's what we're talking about here. So put down the phone, pick up the living and active word, okay? By the ending of this teaching, you'll get to choose. So about our masters, okay? Because we got, we got, like I said earlier, we got two, we got two choices. I don't get to choose Joe, because Joe's 
of the world. He's of the flesh. He's dying. But we've got, we got, we got God. That's obvious. Truth and life. My breakdown is what is his basic elements of existence? He gave us heaven. Justice, all-knowing, truth, plans for good, all things good come from him. God has all authority. He, he is he's infinite, incomparable, unchanging, exists everywhere, knows everything. He has all power. He gives grace. God appears to Moses in a bush that burned, but he didn't get consumed a fire. God didn't get burned up. He never he doesn't get burned up. Jesus walked in a fire. He didn't get burned up. He's walking with you in a fire. The, your fire that's burning in you today, Christ is with you. He's with you in the fire. You don't need to, you don't need to go, help me, help me, help me. Because God's He's with you. He's in the fire. He already knew you were going to be in this fire, and he already planned your way out of the fire. He's already got the escape. Exit signs. He's already got it all there. He's already. He's gonna. You don't even need to see the signs because he's gonna take you right through the door. He's already got it all planned out. You know, on your airplane, because I was just an airplane. They always have you tell. Look. Oh, here's where the exits are. You know, I ignore that stuff. Here's how you work your jacket. Here's how you work. But you know what? I can ignore that stuff when I'm with Jesus. But I can't really. I shouldn't ignore it when I'm in a in a building or in a plane because you might need to get out. But Jesus takes us out of our fires. He takes of our, out of our plane wrecks and train wrecks. The, but the word of God tells us that God is intangible. He said, it also says he exists as three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is infinite. And I got scriptures for all this stuff, but I, I, don't, you know, I don't want to be here six hours instead of five. He's incomparable. He's unchanging. God exists everywhere. He knows everything. He has all power and authority. So now I'm off of Joe's list and I'm on the, on the Bible's list. He is sufficient. We really need to remember this one, folks. Really. El Shaddai is one of God's names. It's Hebrew, which means the almighty, all-sufficient God. He's all-sufficient. It's in his name. You know, if you looked up what Joe meant, it's probably mud, dirt, <laughs> I'll have to look that up later. <laughs> but anyways, but all sufficient. It's his name. You know, in the Bible, they name everybody what they're supposed to be. It's just, it's, it's just so amazing. You look at it, everyone's got a name, and it all means something. And I've really, what I've really learned through um, uh, Pastor Greg's teachings is a deeper understanding of how amazing this Bible is. How amazing every single word, every single name, every single thing is important. And it all is leading us to the cross to be saved. In Philippians, it says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. There's another benefit. Second Corinthians, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is per perfected in weakness. What about God's character? So, much better than our character, because I can't fit. You know, I look at, if I put Joe's character, none, I got none of these. Uh, let's go through them. God is just. Joe's not just. God's loving. Mm. Truthful. God is truthful. He's holy. He shows compassion. He gives mercy. He gives grace. He judges sin. He also offers forgiveness. For God so loves the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him will have everlasting life. What about judging him by his fruit? So let's, let's look at God's fruit. Well, Genesis 1-1, we covered that a month or so ago. God created the world. Wow. Okay, so that's pretty good work, right? I have never created a world myself, and I will never do it. So he actively, then, then he sus actively sustains the world. They talk about that in Colossians 1.17. God sustains the world actively. He's active. He's not sleeping. He's not like a conductor on a train that falls asleep and the thing goes too fast over a rail or something and, and people get hurt. He's, he's executing his eternal plan. Ephesians 1.11 talks about that. Wow. But you know, that's something to think about. He's not actively, not only actively sustaining the world, he's, he's executing his eternal perfect plan. 
which involves the redemption of man from the curse of sin and the toe tag of death. I added that. That was from Galatians. Mm -hmm. um, he draws people to Christ. His, 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 he disciples his children. That's what he wants. That's why we're in church today, to disciple, to put our God glasses on, our holy glasses on. And he will judge the world in Revelations 20, 11. So that, that's something we don't want to be here for. So what about God as far as his relationship with us? Uh, God became incarnate. He dwelt among us to show us the relationship he wants with us. So through his son, he showed us how he wants us to be. He showed us uh, a love that was uh, immense. The son of God became the son of man, the Messiah, because the son of man is a Jewish term, and is therefore the bridge between God and man. He sent us a bridge. You know, we have this cavern, we have this like moat to get, so there's, there's like a castle with Jesus in it, okay? And then there are all these millions and millions of angels, more than the sands, all the sand, right? And, and, and they're all in there, and, but there was a moat keeping me from getting over there, keeping you from getting over there. And there's alligators and maybe a Loch Ness monster, I don't know what is in there, but there's something in there that I can't swim through, so that's out of the question. But he actually sent his son to be a bridge. We're like walking over Jesus' back. Come on, hold still, Jesus. I'm walking. Ah, I'm in the castle. That's, it's that simple. Jesus is the bridge between God and man. He sent an intermediate, an almighty counselor to us. Who's the counselor? The Holy Spirit. Through his son. So we can be forgiven for our sins. This is a good relationship. It really seems kind of one-sided, although the atheist would say it's one-sided towards God because he just wants us to be his slaves. But look at all he's done for us. Look, he, he's, he gave us a bridge. He, he, he sent his son so we can have forgiveness for our sins. Her, his, our sins were forgiven through his son's blood, Christ on the cross, and it wasn't our blood. That's a pretty awesome gift. Because, you know, in that movie I saw, um, she had to die. So, thrown off a cliff. Don't go see it. Uh, he, he has, he's reconciled us with God and given us eternal salvation. Wow. Why didn't he, it, was, it, was all even, it was all good and it was even made better with eternal salvation. So we got forgiveness and eternal salvation. So we should be reconciled away from this dying world to him. Jesus Christ, all of the fullness of the deity, lives in bodily form. Christ said, if you have seen him, <coughs> excuse me, if you have seen him, you have seen the Father. It's important that we, we, we see Christ. To know, to know who God is, all we have to do is look at Jesus and, and know Jesus. So now, now we have the adversary. Or what do we call him at the beginning? I think he was, uh, he is the antagonist. He's antagonizing. He antagonized me for a long time. He's, an he's antagonized you for a long time. And, and so now we got, got to talk about the devil. Well, my elements are, I just, I just talk about the devil as sin and death. That's how I describe him. He's, he's actually found, um, his name was first used in First Chronicles, Chronolo uh, chronologically, Job, which was, um, Satan is also found in Job 1 and 2. Satan literally means adversary, the Hebrew word. So he's, he's, he's named well. So let's see, the elements of Satan. Okay, so, I, you know, in God I had, um, I think I, I, had, I had truth in life. And, um, for Satan, I have uh, his followers spend eternity in hell. That doesn't sound like a good, good deal. The Bible says, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil. That's in 1 John. Satan's basic elements. Uh, well, his fall must have happened somewhere 
after the time angels were created by God, because he created them, and before he attempted Adam and Eve in the garden. Whether he was created an hour or a day or years before he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden, scriptures do not say. But Satan fell because he had pride, because he desired to be God, not to be a servant of God. Just like in the, in the movies, they always, they always want to be God. They always want to be the master of the universe. So, isn't our fleshly and sinful nature much like Satan? We want, we, we want to choose our own path, blaze our own trail, do our own thing, make our own decisions, do our own will. Well, I know God wouldn't want me to do that, but, you know, surely I won't die. You know, it could just be a simple thing. Oh, I want, I want to do my own will. Well, if, you're, if you do your own will, then you're outside of, of God's will. So Satan's character. Satan's proud. He's described in the Bible as being a proud. Not a novice, lest being puffed up, he may fall into condemnation of the devil. Fierce and cruel. Boy, this is really, who would ever choose this guy as a master? He is described as a lion who walks about looking for things to devour. Us is what he wants to devour. So be sober and watchful. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking from who he may devour. Something's going on here. Someone's playing some music here. Powerful. The devil is powerful. <clears throat> Even Michael the archangel would not rebuke him without calling upon the name of Jesus. Now this is something to, you know, you see a lot of this stuff in the, the false doctrine and uh, of Christianity where you got people oh, devil get out I rebuke you I rebuke you devil get out of my house you got all that stuff going on and, and I saw it in that movie uh, something anyways um, war room war room and that lady was walking around kicking the devil out of her house she had no authority she had no authority because it wasn't in a, Jesus has the authority when Michael the archangel contended with the devil and disputed about the body of Moses. He did not dare to bring condemnation or slander to him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. He knows, these angels know who to, who to call upon and what the powers are. The devil's a deceiver and deceitful. Satan's method consists of deception. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast in the field which the Lord God had made. That's in Genesis 3. Subtle. He's also subtle. He's sneaky. Oh, you know, it was innocent. I get those callers all the time. It was innocent. I didn't mean to. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve in his craftiness, your mind should, should be corrupted from the simplicity and purity <clears throat> that is towards Christ. So as long as you put, set your mind on Christ, you can't be beguiled like, like Adam and Eve. A temper. He's angry. One of the names given to the devil in the Bible was the, the, the tempter. Well, I guess it's not temper. I can't even read my own writing. Anyways, it's a tempter. So he's a tempter. He tempts us. So that's what he does. Satan works in conjunction with the world system and the sin nature of man to constantly bring temptation into people's life. See how he works in the, the, the conjunction with the world? This is his... All this stuff is under the, he's the prince of the air. All this stuff is, is what he uses. Everything in the flesh he uses. All the doctors he uses. All the TV he uses. People in, uh, he wants to have people in rebellion against God and agreeing with him. We see it all the time. Okay, yes, it's a, you know, God changed. He doesn't mind gay marriage. It's okay. Marry two guys and two gals. It doesn't matter if men are showering with little girls. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Walk around naked in the mall if you want. It's okay. Just like Adam and Eve. Even Jesus was tempted by the devil. Temptation is inevitable in this world, so don't even be taken off guard when it happens. Like Jesus, we should be prepared, prepared to stand against temptation of the world. So in, in the Bible, when Jesus was tempted, he just, he just quoted Bible scriptures. Oh, it's not good to tempt God. I mean, he's right there. He's, he's throwing, he's, and we can throw the word out and use the word to keep ourselves on. The devil is a thief. In John 10, 10, Jesus referred to the, to the devil as the thief. Satan loves to steal from people. That's what he loves to do. The devil is a murderer. Jesus said it. He was a murderer from the beginning. 
in John 8, 44, through murder, suicide, whether it's murder, suicide, drug overdoses, abortion, sickness, or otherwise, Satan is a destroyer. He kills people. He also kills family. He kills churches. He is the distorter. He is, he is not, a, he, the devil is not a creator. Instead, he takes what God created and perverts it. Well, well, we know where perverts come from because they must be coming from the devil. Sexuality, he perverted that. It's to be enjoyed by a husband and a wife in context with marriage. Satan perverted it through promiscuity, adultery, homosexuality, pornography, and other distortions. Distortion is his counterfeiting of, of, of power of God. He, he distorts even the power of God. And he, and he distorts the, the gifts, the genuine gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gift of prophecy is used in occult divination. Psychics, fortune tellers, astrologers, false prophets are operating in demonic spirits that mimics true gift of prophecy. Who is Satan by his work? Well, in the Garden of Eden was probably his first work. He, 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 he came to Eve with a question, raising doubts about the goodness of God. And he implied that God was a liar. Surely you won't die. God said you will die. So surely you will die. But he implied God was a liar. He, Satan, by his works, indirectly opposed uh, Jesus through demonic helpers, through human instruments. Uh, spiritual leaders in Israel... During the supper, the devil already, and, and it says in John 13 too, during supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, and after the morsel, Satan then entered him, into him. Jesus therefore said to him, what you do, do quickly. Well, you know, that's, Satan's really fast. I mean, he enters your heart, and then he completely enters you, and you, and he is your master. So, how to defeat Satan? Well, Satan's already Satan's already been defeated by the blood of Jesus. If you understand and believe that your sin nature will not have dominion over your life, and you put the full armor of God. So, in Ephesians six eleven. Put the, full, put the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So how's, how's your armor doing? So I, I haven't heard my little handout thing, but you guys can use this later to, have your, to remind yourself who Jesus Christ is and who Satan is um, if you needed reminding of the differences. But we, have to, but we have to make choices. You may think, well, I've already accepted him as my... Lord and Savior, I was baptized, I was sprinkled, I did this, I did that. But it's not about just accepting him, it's about following him. You know, in, in college or grades, we can, we can pick a class, but if we don't go, what good is it? How, 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 how are we doing on our sanctification? We accepted him, and, and then you know, unless we daily uh, check us to see if we're in the faith, We've got to choose it every single day. And so people should be able to tell, as we talked about earlier, every word from our mouth and every decision we make, who is our master. So we have to choose one. God is. The devil is. Both exist. They're the only two choices. You don't get to add more. God gave us choice. So why do we struggle? Because God gave us choice. We may say, oh, that's not fair. Why did he give us choice? Doesn't he love us? Well, love is giving choice. You don't go, hey, you don't go up to some girl on the street or guy on the street for you ladies because we're outnumbered here. Well, thanks for coming because you're helping us weigh the scales here. <laughs> but um, uh, you don't go up there, hey, you know what? You're hot, okay? You're my, you're my husband. You're my wife, right? We don't just say that. That's not love. That's not love. You're having my baby. You're having my baby, you know? <laughs> <laughs> to someone we don't even know? No, we got to know them. There's got to be a relationship. There's got to be a choice. We get to choose. We get to choose. So we're not robots. God is fair. We can choose to be with him. We get to choose who we spend eternity with, the guy with the goodies or the guy with the good things. That's what I like. That's another 
put that on the list of, of new things. The guy with the goodies and the guy with the good things. I want the, I want the good things. Cause, and all good things come from above, right? The goodies are all around here, you know? The, you know what? Those storage units over there across the street, they're all filled with goodies. They were once goodies. Now they're just like a monthly payment <laughs> on a storage unit. On stuff that someone hasn't seen in a year. My mom's got a storage unit in uh, Hawaii. She's had it for years. She's lived with us for five years, I think. Yeah, at least five years, five, six years. And she, every month, you know, every year they raise that storage thing up. I don't know what's in that thing, but, you know, it costs $117 a month. Whatever's in that thing for the last five years, and she just didn't get that thing when she moved in with us. She had it for years before that. So maybe she's had it for 10 years. How, how much money is all that stuff worth? It's like a new car is hiding somewhere in there or something like that. Instead, it's, it's an old computer or an old printer or something like that that doesn't, you can't even plug it in anymore to a computer because the cords don't fit in the new computers. But I mean, all of this stuff, we, we, we're storing up our tre treasures on earth. So, um, the goodies down here, no good. The good things up there, good. So we have to choose. Why do we have to choose? Because we're toe tagged. We're toe tagged. Born, sentenced to death. If we choose, if we choose God, it's the ending for the devil in our lives. Who doesn't want that? You want to just say bye bye, devil. You're out. That was my that was my gravy impression. How about? Bye-bye, Dabbley. <laughs> but that's the ending for, for, for the devil in our lives. It doesn't end it for everybody else's life, but it, it can help us to bring others to the saving knowledge of Christ. It happens when we follow God and his only provision. So how many provisions did God give us to, to, uh, to get us into heaven? How many for forgiveness? One. There's only one. He, he had one provision for us all, all the way since the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. He had one provision for us, his son, the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, who came to die for us. So the Bible says that God, the God of peace will crush Satan under, under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Wow. See, that's what he wants to do when we follow him. Here's what God tells those who are going to make the other decision. That are not that don't want to be with him. Jesus turned of the turned turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have, have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Mm. Well, he said that to Peter, and we know later Peter did well. Peter was bestowed with the Holy Spirit. So this is really good news for us. First of all, we're thinking, wow, that's kind of mean that this guy's been following you around for a while, and then you say, Get behind me, Satan, and you tell him basically he's going to hell. But then Peter obviously um, gets back on track like we can. We stumble, we get back on track like Peter did, even though he denied him three times and he said he wouldn't. Isn't that funny how we always tell God, no, I'm not going to do that. Don't worry about it. I'm never going to do that again. No, yeah, you will. I know, I already know everything. So we need to, our, our daily concerns, human concerns, mainly human, we have to have human concerns, okay? But are they mainly human concerns? So we need to make sure that we're checking ourselves. So there's a warning in the Bible how to remain faithful to Christ so that way we can do the things of God. It says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Not just something to devour like we talked about earlier, but someone. Resist him. Resist him. Does that mean, oh, man, devil, get away from me. Get away. No. Standing firm in your, your feet, your faith, your faith. Because you know that the, the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. They're undergoing the same. Everyone's, all the believers are like us. They, they are suffering just like us. There's no, there's no difference. We think we're something special. Wow, the devil was really mad. He threw that curveball at me. No one else lives like that. I get marriage callers all the time. Well, things aren't going so well. This is nothing new. Everybody, this is everybody's problem. Everyone has the same problem because the devil's got no tricks. Faith 
in what? Standing firm in the faith of Jesus, his blood on the cross. So uh, putting the full armor of God. So let's turn in our Bibles to Ephesians 6.11. I know, I tricked you. You thought you were going to get to put your Bibles away. So Ephesians 6.11, we're just going to read 11 through 16. For our, so this actually starts in 12, excuse me. For our struggles are not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when, be, when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after having done everything to stand, stand firm, then with a the belt of truth, buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. We're reading the Bible, folks. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows, arrows of the evil one. That's, again, Ephesians 6, starting in 12. So, you know, Judas Iscariot traded God for some coins. He traded heaven for coins. And in the end, he was so tricked, beguiled, I'll use those words because those in the Bible, beguiled by the devil after he did it, just like the devil. When we sin, the devil rubs our faces in. He doesn't go, hey, good job. And when he's done with us, he's done with us. He was done with, with Judas. He's done with him. And then Judas doesn't even get to enjoy the money because there was no enjoyment in the sin because it led to his death. So the, so the moment you've been working, waiting for, in closing, this will be the first closing. So here on earth, there are many gods ruled by Satan, but he doesn't rule over our God. He's just a faker. And yet God will judge, and he is honest and fair. <laughs> Those who choose Satan will be with Satan. Those who choose God will be with God. Those who choose God, follow God. Those who choose Satan, follow Satan. Seems pretty cut and dry. God is good, Satan is bad. All good things come from God. So you, if you've got your calculator still out, you can count all. And bad things come from Satan, eternal death being one of them. God is love, Satan is hate. God is truth, Satan is lies. God is so loving, he actually helped us with the answer and our choice. The time to commit, even though we're already saved, recommit daily to our walk. Who is our master? Who is the truth? Who is the way? Who is the life? Who is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, and knows everything? Who is your true God? Because we know who the true God is, it's not... It shouldn't be work, school, kids, husband, wife, doctor, medicine, shrink, money. Whatever you're a slave to, you name it. You get to fill in the blanks. No matter how you choose or when, when, when you're in a battle with your stronghold or your fears or your disability, your slave master, uh, your, your illness, those are the things that, you, that are master over you. Your choice in for God does not change God. It changes you. It changed me. And it should be changing us daily. It should be changing how we walk, how we talk, how we act. It should be a complete change in us. He needs to be your master or you will perish. So who's your master? God didn't just, you know, like anything else, God doesn't just say, hey, you know what, um, you have a choice to make. I'm not really going to tell you what it is, and I'm not even going to show you, tell you the answer. You just figure it out yourself. Now, like nowadays, you know what? Is that baby that just popped out of you a boy or a girl? Looks like a boy, but maybe he wants to be a girl, so let's just put other. Okay, so the world wants us to have the other choice. Okay? God's not like that. He tells us. He, he, says, he says it all through the Bible. He says, God supplies us with the information to make a decision. And you may be thinking... Where, how do we know God is God? How do we know we should be following him? He told us throughout the whole Bible. I don't know. I'm not sure if you were listening. Let's see. It says, 
Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. You know in that movie, by the way, I digress again, that, that, that adversary said the word I am. That really twerked me off. But it's so much like the devil to, to implant himself in everything that's of him. He's like the guy that does the, the Marvel comic strips. I forget what his name is. Uh, but he always puts himself in the movie. You know, in this movie, he puts himself in like a bus driver or something like that. But he always puts himself in the movie, the creator of, of this comic strip stuff. What's funny is the devil always puts himself in everything too. The devil puts himself everywhere. He put him. He he put he put himself in the. That guy thought he put himself in the movie, but really the devil put himself in the movie by listing the bad guy as the I am. So in John six, I am the living breath of uh, bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Need more. And he said to him, you are from the beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Thus Jesus spoke to him again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have everlasting light. I want, I want to walk in the light. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Because everyone was stuck on the flesh. They, all, the, all the Pharisees said, well, what about Abraham? He's a man. Before Abraham, I am, is what Jesus said. In John 10, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. John, John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. He certainly does. Are you one of his sheep? Did you choose him? Did you still choose him? Will you continue choosing him tomorrow? Will you continue using him when you go out of the parking lot? Will you continue choosing? It is a daily choice because you can walk away from that choice. You can give it all up if you want to live in self-will. John 10, 36. Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent to the world, you are, a, uh, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. Father sanctified Jesus and he wants to sanctify us, you and me. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. That's good news for us. He wants to resurrect wreck you and me, but there's a choice. We just don't die and get resurrected. We'll get judged, but he wants to resurrect us to heaven. So that's our choice. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He can't lie, folks. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. He notes here that there's, there's, there is one true vine. See, we're walking, in the world, we're like walking through like a winery already of, of vineyards and branches, and we're looking for the best. We're looking for uh, the right vine, and he is the one true vine. And we have to choose the right vine. Not the one at convenience. Maybe we got to go all the way to the end of the vineyard. Maybe in the middle. Maybe it's hiding somewhere. It's going to take a little work, but we've got, we've got, we've, we've found the truth, folks, and we should be sharing it with other people. Therefore, the chief of priests and the Jews said to Pilate, uh, Pilate, I almost said Pilate, but I did it anyways. Do not write the king of Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. <laughs> He's the king of the Jews. He told the truth right to the last breath. And today, you know what? He still tells the truth. He didn't change to be a liar because we're liars. He, he didn't change and he, he doesn't change at all he's the same today as he is yesterday and today and will be forever so in Acts 7 amazing this the scriptures uh, Stephen speaking of Moses encounter at the burning bush saying I am the God of your fathers the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and Moses trembled and dared not look 
Stephen said this before his death. He didn't say, don't kill me. He just told them the facts and told, told, told them about the lies and deceptions. But they, killed, but they killed him anyways because they were serving someone else. I mean, he, you know, you look at these people that followed Christ and they have this peace about them, even when they were getting stoned in the head with rocks. I don't, I don't think I could even do that. You know what I mean? I, I don't, I, I'd be crying and blabbing, blubbering like a baby probably. I don't even know. I'd just try to punch myself in the face so I could die quicker or something. I don't know. But these people are amazing. Their, their faith. But you know what? Sometimes I wonder about that kind of stuff. What's it going to be when I'm about to die? Am I like going to go out kicking and screaming? But you know what I know about God? He always prepares us. Just like he prepared us for the choice of, of Jesus, of, of God or the devil. He, he always prepares us, and he's going to prepare us for death when, when we're close to him. And we'll know peace even through our, our physical death. Uh, in Acts 9, he said, And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Pastor Greg loves those goad things. <laughs> Always kicking. The conspirator to kill Stephen and is now reckoning, being reconciled to, to God. Wow. I mean, God is always, he's always working. God, God will blind us and then open our eyes like he did with Paul. So that way we don't have to go to hell. So, so God told you, choose and walk every step with the great I am. Lord, we just thank you that, uh, that you give us protection from the enemy, Lord, the liar, the deceiver, the murderer since the beginning. I pray protection over each and every one of, of the people here and the children in the back, Lord, that you would be protecting them from the evil one and that you would uh, send your warring angels to, to pre-fight every battle that's coming, Lord, and that you would give us peace so that way we, we would know rightly to give you the glory. I pray that we always give you the glory in everything because all good things come from you and nothing comes good from us, Lord. Just a bunch of dying stuff. We pray for safe travels for people driving home, Lord, that you'd be with them and be with the other cars around them, Lord, and the people. Uh, we just thank you that you could be here with us, that you would actually come to be with us and gather with us and that you would seek us, that you would leave the 99 for the one. We just praise your holy name. Amen. Amen. Now that you're sent out, now that, now that, now that you're, you've made a choice, hopefully you chose the right one. I think you guys did. You're sent out, and you can tell other people about the choice.